This video is part of Project Homecoming 2. Today, several other history YouTubers and I are making special videos about our hometowns, and you can find the playlist in the end credits and the description below. Pasadena is a hidden city. Though its city center is only 20 kilometers away from that of neighboring Los Angeles, this is largely a coincidence. The local culture, economy, and architecture are quite distinct and as we shall soon see, Pasadena was once one of the largest and most important cities in California. In the 2020 United States Census, Pasadena reported a total population of 138,699, a number that has scarcely increased since the 1990s, though this fails to include large, densely populated unincorporated areas, which have thus far resisted annexation into the city proper. It is also the largest city and administrative center of the San Gabriel Valley, which is home to 1.4 million people. This is where I was born, and it's where I've spent most of my life. The known history of Pasadena begins with the Keech people, a yudo aztecan nation closely related to the Shoshone of the Inner Mountain West. Known in Spanish as the Gabrielinos, or ahistorically as the Tonga, the Keech largely lived scattered across small villages of a few dozen or hundred people, many of which were located in what is now Pasadena. The most famous of these was Hahamongo, meaning Laughing Water, which was also the name of the principal body of water, the Arroyo Seco. It's much more impressive in the winter. Though colonization came surprisingly late to California, the ravages of European disease didn't. Brought by Spanish and Filipino sailors, as well as Russian and Aleut fur trappers from Alaska. But it was Spanish rule that finally brought the traditional Keech way of life to an end. In 1769, near the very end of its era as a great power, the Kingdom of Spain authorized the explorer Gaspar de Portola to establish Spanish rule over the area north of the California peninsula, previously known by the English name New Albion, with a series of towns and forts. Being far removed from the traditional feudal society of central and southern Mexico, the vast majority of land in this new territory was given over to the Franciscan order of the Catholic Church, who promptly enslaved the local peoples and forced them to build and live on a series of large church complexes known as missions. The Franciscans' treatment of the native tribes, and their near monopoly on land, set the stage for a series of rebellions and a decades-long power struggle between religious and secular authorities. This is the period setting for most of the Zorro mythos. In 1821, Mexico became independent, which included the province now known as Alta California. But California had never participated in the fight for independence, and for the next quarter of a century existed effectively in a state of constant rebellion, including two independence movements. This period, known as La Soberania, is the setting for the Zorro movie with Antonio Banderas. One popular thing the Mexican authorities did was to break the power of the missions and parcel out former church lands to the local farmers and ranchers who had already been living and working on it for half a century. This area, Rancho del Rincón de San Pascual, was originally granted to one of the early colonists, a locally powerful woman of European and African descent named Eulalia Pérez de Guillén Mariné, though she only held the land for a brief period. After changing hands several times, the rancho came into the possession of an American-turned-Mexican-turned-American politician named Benjamin Davis Wilson, or Don Benito. Namesake of streets, mountains with observatories thereon, and places of education elementary of Aranos. He mostly used the land to produce wine. Now, while California was annexed by the U.S. in 1848, in Southern California at least, very little changed. Spanish language and customs continued to dominate the region for decades, and even most English-speaking newcomers were quick to assimilate. A big part of that was hospitality culture. Wilson loved hosting guests at his various properties, and in the winter of 1873, he hosted a doctor from Indianapolis named Daniel Barry. Barry, who had suffered from asthma for most of his life, was permanently cured of his ailment when he visited the area, and thought some of Wilson's land could serve as the perfect colony with which to treat his patients, who suffered from, say it with me, tuberculosis. 
In just over a year, Barry was able to corral a large number of progressive-minded colleagues, mostly from the Chicago area, to establish the Indiana Colony the following year. This Midwestern heritage, by the way, is the reason for Pasadena's very distinctive architecture and accent. At the same time, Barry inspired Wilson to get in on the action and establish his own town right next door called Lake Vineyard. Having two unincorporated communities that were so closely entangled and rapidly growing caused a number of problems for locals, some more sympathetic than others. Firstly, the U.S. Post Office didn't like the name. In the wake of the Civil War, the Post Office was very aggressive in standardizing place names, and Indiana Colony didn't sound to them like a real place. In 1875, a number of options were considered before settling on Pasadena, a Native American word meaning the valley. And by Native American, I mean Ojibwe, an indigenous people of the Great Lakes where the settlers originally came from because by this time nobody in the San Gabriel Valley still spoke Keech. Then there were the Chinese. Like most towns in California, Pasadena had a sizable Chinese minority who largely lived and worked in a small neighborhood near the center of town. And like most towns in California, that came to a violent end in the 1880s, when Chinatown was burned down and its residents chased out of town. With Pasadena now the fastest growing town in California, the leading men of the time wanted to create an exclusion zone around the city center where ethnic Chinese would be banned from living. But this required the creation of a city government. So too did the regulation of alcohol. Like many progressives of the time, most of Pasadena's founders were part of the temperance movement. And while most of them didn't support outright prohibition of alcohol, they were determined that their community wouldn't allow saloons or hard liquor. When the owner of Pasadena's main general store was caught selling liquor, it was finally decided to incorporate in order to stop him. The city of Pasadena was finally incorporated in June of 1886, and its first act was to impose what they wrongly believed to be a prohibitively high tax on any establishment which sold liquor or served alcohol in-house, soon followed by a ban on Chinese people living downtown, which ironically created an opening for a large wave of Japanese immigrants. But none of this went far enough for residents living south of Columbia Street, which I couldn't fit onto this map who broke away to form the city of South Pasadena in order to ban the sale of alcohol entirely, as well as to ban black people from living there. By this time, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad had, through various subsidiaries, completed a transcontinental railroad connecting Los Angeles to Chicago through Pasadena, turning the city into an immensely popular vacation spot for the rich and later middle class of the Great Lakes. A large number of wealthy industrialists built winter homes in the southwestern part of the city, and elaborate resorts started popping up all over, including the famous Mount Low Railway and the original Bush Gardens. In 1890, the affluent Valley Hunt Club sought to capitalize on this trend by holding a beauty contest every new year with girls from the local high schools. The winner of the contest, crowned the Rose Queen, would then be paraded through the city on a float made entirely of roses and in 1902, the parade began to be followed by a college football championship at the newly constructed Rose Bowl. Big success. By the end of the 19th century, travel to Pasadena was in such high demand that at one point there were eight different railway lines just connecting Pasadena and Los Angeles. This cheesecake factory used to be a train station. This piano gallery used to be a train station. This furniture store used to be a train station. This train station is still a train station. In the decades that followed, Pasadena became a major stopping point on the famous U.S. Route 66 and home to North America's first freeway, the Arroyo Seco Parkway. During this period, Pasadena was among the 10 largest cities in California and the fourth largest in Southern California, surpassed only by Los Angeles, San Diego, and Long Beach. But by World War II, the character and economy of Pasadena had changed drastically. The city's population had become much more ethnically diverse in the 1910s, experiencing a large influx of black migrants from the American South, as well as a wave of Armenian immigrants who had previously fled the Ottoman Genocide by taking refuge in Palestine. The tourism economy had collapsed during the Great Depression and never fully recovered, with all but one of the old resorts either being burned down for the insurance money or repurposed for other things. This is the Vista del Arroyo. 
It's one of the original six resort hotels in Pasadena, one of the three that survived. And in World War II, it became an army hospital. In fact, this is where my father and uncle served back when the US had mandatory military service. My uncle was sent to Vietnam and my father stayed here because he was a jobnik. Now it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Incredibly, a few of Pasadena's early leaders had seen this coming. In 1891, failed Chicago politician turned Pasadena mayor Amos Throop established Throop University, later known as Caltech, one of the most selective and prestigious universities in the United States. Side note, in recent years, Caltech has developed a really nasty reputation for some hardcore union busting and predatory real estate dealing, so take that as you will. On the strength of Caltech, Pasadena's economy rapidly pivoted from tourism to science and technology. In conjunction with the university's founding, George Ellery Hale financed and built the Mount Wilson Observatory. And in 1936, with the lead up to the Second World War, the U.S. military worked with Caltech to establish the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which despite its old name has spent most of its existence as NASA's Research and Development Center for Unmanned Space Exploration, which is why Tom Scott's always hanging around there. In addition to a large number of technology and engineering firms, the success of Caltech and JPL did a great deal to make Pasadena a major intellectual hub, with the opening of the Pasadena Playhouse in 1924, the continuing success of Roman's Bookstore, and a whole bunch of museums and smaller places of education. The stark cultural differences between Pasadena and Los Angeles also made it extremely popular as a filming location, usually standing in for the American Midwest. While shooting B-roll for this video, I sent some of it back to a friend from Sweden who remarked that the city looked like every typical American city he'd seen in movies or TV. It literally is. Because of Pasadena's historical significance, lots of famous people have been born or lived there, but there are only a select handful that the city has noticeably embraced. There's the pioneering television chef Julia Child. A more recent favorite is the science fiction author Octavia Butler. But by far, Pasadena's favorite son is Jackie Robinson, second baseman for the Brooklyn Dodgers who broke Major League Baseball's unofficial ban on black players in 1947. In my experience, Robinson is totally obscure outside of North America, but he was the opening act of America's post-war civil rights movement and is one of the most celebrated figures in American history, period. To the point that his historical significance arguably overshadows both his incredible athleticism and the true extent of his activism. While Pasadena remained economically strong during the Cold War, it still experienced a lot of the same problems as other American cities at the time. Middle-class white families rapidly decamp for the suburbs, reducing tax revenue and making administration more difficult, leading to a vicious cycle of crime and poverty. In 1974, the 210 freeway was completed, which not only destroyed large areas of the city like Japantown, but created a physical barrier around the mostly non-white or working-class neighborhoods of the North and East. But because of those same problems, those areas also became a popular destination for university students and recent graduates to find affordable housing. And this is where I come in. So this is Washington Square uh, off of North Lake Avenue. And this is the neighborhood where I grew up. I would describe it as a neighborhood in a perpetual state of arrested gentrification. Gang violence was not unheard of, and uh, when I was in elementary school, a lot of my friend's parents were reticent about bringing them to a birthday party here. In fact, uh, during the 80s, this was pretty much the center of the PCP manufacturing industry in Southern California. There was this big like kingpin and everything named Ray Ray Browning. Uh, I think he's still alive. So there were these four houses on one side of Belvedere Street and those were all Jewish families and we would do everything together. Hanukkah, Passover, even like Gregorian New Year, 4th of July, uh, election nights. And I've always joked uh, as an adult that 
this was the Jewish part of town. Um, turns out I was wrong. According to the American Jewish Yearbook, Pasadena had a total Jewish population of 1,600 in 1965. I'm using 1965 because that's the last year that the AJC collected statistics from individual cities. But whatever vague stats I could scrounge up from Google indicate that the number is about the same now, making Jews a little over 1% of the city's population. Washington Square has a population of 1,875. Since it's a neighborhood listed for historical preservation, that number is probably about the same as when I was born. And by my estimation, the total Jewish population of Washington Square circa 1989 peaked at 12, or just over half a percent of the neighborhood. So not only was Washington Square not the Jewish neighborhood, it was actually less Jewish than the city as a whole. This was the point when I realized, I don't know anything about the Jewish history of Pasadena. So, let's start over. In 1877, decades before the Jewish American Yearbook, a silk manufacturer from Philadelphia named William Bauer Hackenberg set out to give a complete survey of the entire Jewish population of the United States, down to the tiniest farming and mining communities with Jewish populations in the single digits. For San Gabriel Township, California, the area that would later become Pasadena and its immediate suburbs, the reported Jewish population is five. And thanks to some incredible work by the ever self-aggrandizing Pasadenans, we know who they were. Jacob Weil and Nathan Tuck first arrived as ranchers back in the 1850s and later settled in the Indiana Colony in Lake Vineyard. Moritz and Helen Rosenbaum were two of the Indiana Colony's original founders and the owners of the first general store. In fact, it was Maurice Rosenbaum who had been caught selling liquor, leading to Pasadena's incorporation as a city. But of the five, Matthew Slavin is probably the most historically significant. As a contractor, he was responsible for building many of Pasadena's earliest commercial buildings, so much of the neighborhood known as Old Pasadena is his handiwork. He later served as the first Jewish member of Pasadena's city council, where he was instrumental to modernizing the city's water infrastructure. Now, none of these people had any children who were both Jewish and lived in Pasadena, but around the time of incorporation, the U.S. was on the receiving end of the largest migration in Jewish history, so the foundations of a lasting Jewish community were quick to arrive. During the first decade of the 20th century, a handful of Jewish families moved to Pasadena, almost all of them living and working in an area of just a couple blocks right in Old Town. If ever Pasadena had a Jewish neighborhood, this was it. So this is what used to be the Jewish quarter of Pasadena. For those of you familiar with the area, you can just think of it as the, uh, the few blocks west of Memorial Park Station. There isn't really anything left to suggest that this was a Jewish neighborhood, but most of the buildings are still here. Honestly, this could be Western Street in Chicago, which I guess makes sense. By 1908, this small community finally acquired a Torah scroll from Los Angeles and observed Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for the first time. With the community still being very small, an actual congregation was still impossible to organize. So, not unlike my childhood in Washington Square, Jewish celebrations and observances were inconsistent and usually conducted in people's houses. While Northern California had been a major Jewish center since the 1850s, Southern California's Jewish population lagged far behind, even as Los Angeles rose to surpass San Francisco as the largest city. By the end of the First World War, the Jewish population had risen to 350. And in 1922, the synagogue B'nai Yisrael, better known as the Hudson Street Temple, opened its doors. The 1920s remained a tenuous period for the community. There are kibbutzim with more than 350 people, and they actually live together. Indeed, until the 1930s, everyone who worked at the synagogue, the rabbi, cantor, Sunday school teachers, were all unpaid volunteers, which may explain why B'nai Yisrael went through eight rabbis in its first decade of existence. It's also notable that B'nai Yisrael was and is a conservative Jewish synagogue, though this is fairly common for smaller communities. 
There was an attempt later in the decade to establish an Orthodox synagogue in the old Jewish neighborhood around Memorial Park, but it was pretty short-lived, and Bnei Yisrael, mindful of the need to serve a small but religiously broad community, has always been pretty pluralistic. Incidentally, they're currently looking for a new rabbi, and they're accepting applicants with non-conservative ordinations. So, if you're interested, tell them Sam sent you. By 1930, the Jewish community had grown to 1,400, and was finally large enough to secure the future of the synagogue, pay its employees, and establish other communal institutions like local chapters of the service organizations Bnei Brith and Hadassah, and not one, but two kosher butchers. This sudden population growth can largely be attributed to the children of pre-war Jewish immigrants from the East, who saw Pasadena's booming tourism industry as a healthier and more lucrative alternative to heavy industry in Los Angeles. However, you may recall that this was the exact moment when Pasadena's tourism industry collapsed and never recovered, which may explain why the Jewish population has barely changed since. All of a sudden, that heavy industrial work in Los Angeles seemed a lot more appealing as a way out of the Great Depression for migrant families from the Midwest, like mine. That isn't to say that Jewish life in Pasadena declined. In 1940, Pasadena's local streetcar system was dismantled. Around the same time, most of the community had moved out of the old Jewish neighborhood around Memorial Park. Scattered across the city, most Pasadena Jews now had no choice but to drive to the Hudson Street Synagogue. But without anywhere to park, the congregation moved to a new, much larger location overlooking Eaton Canyon and ironically built in the style of a Spanish colonial mission. Which, uh, which I kind of forgot existed. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, we didn't go here. This was a conservative synagogue. We went to Temple Sinai in Glendale. This is a lot bigger. Insofar as Pasadena's population continued to grow in the 1930s, it was almost entirely due to the emergence of Caltech as one of America's leading universities. Of course, during this period, many Jewish and anti-fascist scientists in Europe fled to the United States to escape persecution and continue their work. The first of these arrivals was Benno Gutenberg, a meteorologist and seismologist who was purged from German academia during the rise of the Nazis, and upon his arrival in Pasadena, worked closely with Charles Richter to create the Richter scale for measuring earthquakes. Later in the decade, Gutenberg tempted Albert Einstein into taking a job at Caltech, to the point that Einstein actually bought a house here, though he ultimately declined the position. If there's a single Jewish figure who's particularly remembered or commemorated, it's the theoretical physicist Richard Feynman. Born in New York, educated at MIT, and a veteran of the Manhattan Project, Feynman fully embraced Pasadena as his home, where he proved to be a great scientist, a revolutionary science communicator, and an altogether shitty human being. As Pasadena icons go, he and George Ellery Hale are probably the most publicly commemorated from within the scientific community, though Feynman wrestled tremendously with his Jewish identity, much as he did with everything else. And although not quite on the level of prestige of a theoretical physicist, Van Halen frontman David Lee Roth was a Pasadena local who attended the synagogue. In 1947, Bnei Yisrael merged with the various Jewish clubs and organizations in the city to form the Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center. And in 1983, the same year my parents got married and moved to Washington Square, the PJTC established the Weizmann Day School, the only Jewish school in the San Gabriel Valley. It's actually the Weizmann School that turned my mom off the Pasadena Temple, since the school principal in the 90s didn't allow kids to celebrate Halloween. And at some point during all of this, Pasadena got a Chabad center, which has amazingly managed to stick around. To be perfectly honest, I have no idea what to make of all this. I mostly made this video as an excuse to talk about the history of Pasadena, something I would never have had the opportunity to do in my regular videos. And since I didn't know anything about the Jewish history of Pasadena, I thought this would be an interesting learning opportunity. But the more I look into it, the less interested I am in Pasadena's Jewish past, and the more I think about its future. In 2003, Rabbi Joshua Levine Grader took over as leader of the PJTC. Though a native of Woodland Hills, just 50 kilometers away, he had until then been completely unaware of a Jewish community in Pasadena, 
and was so blown away by what he found that he later wrote an op-ed confidently predicting that Pasadena would become California's next great Jewish center by 2020. It probably goes without saying that this didn't happen, but I completely understand why he felt that way. Pasadena's Jewish population has just always been there, and while it hasn't grown at all in almost a century, Jewish life in Pasadena hasn't ever declined either. In 2015, Pasadena elected its first Jewish mayor. When I visited the PJTC for research, there was a pride and optimism there that's lacking in a lot of other Jewish communities. And it's telling that even though he no longer leads the congregation, Rabbi Grader still lives and works in Pasadena fighting against the homelessness crisis. Maybe this is just me desperately trying to cobble together a conclusion because that's how essays work. Others before me have tried to examine this exact topic and failed to produce a coherent narrative. But I get it. Even if I didn't know about it until I was 33 years old, this is part of my story too. And I want to see where it goes next. Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, FC, Matthew Feinberg, Jay Fleischman, Osher Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Jacob Kossoff, Robinson Crusoe, Eric Lederman, Jeffrey Schweitzer, and Ian York.